Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Alex Morris, also known as The Science of Hitting. He writes at Substack under the TSOH Investment Research Service. He's been on the show before. He came up, saw me. We hung out for the day. We had a little bit of uh, wine, a whole lot of fun, and recorded this episode I can't say enough good things about him. I think he's got his head on straight. I think the way that he looks at the world and is settled into his investment style is very cool. I think that he's one of the few people that practices what he preaches. He's totally transparent with what he's doing. He doesn't shy away from performance when it's bad he answers questions directly. I mean, I just, I, I think the world of him. I think he's he's one of the guys that really is doing things the right way. And I enjoy reading him. I hope that at least some of you subbed his service and get some value out of it. And, you know, without further ado, none of this is investment advice. All of this is for entertainment purposes only. Please do your own due diligence and consult a financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Hope you enjoy the episode. Science of Hitting Investing, who I once referred to as an investment Sherpa. I don't know. Your mother thought that was funny, I believe. (laughs) Uh, Back for a repeat performance. We had a nice day today, right? We did. We played some golf, which you destroyed me at. We played some tennis, which... There were a lot of people there, but I would say I destroyed you at. Yeah, you have two forehands. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't know that about me. I don't know the backhand, just two forehands. Dude, it was <laughs> wild. You were sitting there, and you reached out with your left hand, and I was like, "Did is he lefty? And then the next time I saw it, I was like, no, he's just got two forehands. That is a different way to play tennis. I, that, I respect. It works for tennis, so being ambidextrous, which I think I technically am, I'm not positive, doesn't work well for basketball because when you go to shoot, you do the open wing mm. thing as opposed to having a dominant hand. So my, my basketball shot has struggled for a long time because of that, but it works for tennis. You played pretty reasonable defense on the children today. Yes, they're not that tall. But. No, <laughs> <laughs> they are quite a, bit, quite a bit smaller than you. So, you know, I enjoyed chatting with you today as always. My favorite quote of the day is we were talking about uh, waiting for a pitch to hit, and it feels like the current market everything is a major league pitcher and uh, potentially they're, they look like fastballs, but their slider is breaking off a table right now. Yes. They're not that easy to hit right now. It doesn't seem. <laughs> yeah, no, it really doesn't. So at the firm that you left, when did you start sort of like investing professionally? So going back when I was in school and just figuring out what I was going to do and eventually found investing that was in 2011. And I went and worked at a really small RIA, which had, you know, $10 million of assets, basically a family office where the guy was just trying to figure out what to do. And he brought me on as the only employee, which for me was absolutely perfect. Cause I just wanted complete, just go out and do whatever you think you need to be doing to learn investing. So I'd sit there and, you know, study for the CFA. I was looking deeply at companies for really the first time ever, or at least I thought I was looking deeply. And maybe in hindsight, I was still just, you know, getting my feet under me. But it gave me a lot of, of flexibility, and, and I used that for five years. It was a perfect job for me. I didn't get paid very much, but <laughs> it was a perfect job for me. So, you know, got CFA, MBA, all that jazz, moved to a much bigger firm, and, you know, there it was much more access to resources, but a very similar kind of gig where I came in and said, you know, what I care about is the investment research process and looking at companies. And that's what I want to spend my time doing. And, you know, thankfully they were open to that. So yeah, that was in 2016, I believe. And writing through this whole period, it was just so hugely important. And even before meeting you and other people like Francisco, who have become just great friends and people I talk to investments about all the time, it was a way to start, you know, building a community and getting feedback in a way that, you know, in the RAA business, it's a, it's a financial planning business more than anything else. And, and rightly so. But you don't fit in as well if you really want to be an investment person and, you know, really should be at a fund of some kind. So 
but it's been fantastic to to have that experience and also to to learn from people online. Yeah. I sometimes wonder uh maybe I shouldn't be so much of an investment person is is the <laughs> thought that I got uh going on right now. It's it dude, it's been a wild time. Um I guess what I was getting at is have you ever seen a market like this before? And I think the answer for both of us is no. Uh, I don't think many people have. Um, I was so new to it in the financial crisis days that I don't even remember it as a formative event. Maybe it's different for you, but it wasn't, it didn't stick probably because the companies I was buying anyways deserved to be down 60, 70, 80%. They were <laughs> not good businesses. I had no clue what I was doing. You know, I think about it a lot as I, as I look at a track record now and my performance over time. And I think, you know, did I really know what I was doing five, 10 years ago, maybe even three years ago, you know, you're just always trying to learn and get better. And it's tough to say it's a business where it's so objective in terms of what your performance is and whether or not you're good. I also think when you're in your twenties, thirties, maybe even older than that, like you need to give yourself the time to actually get the experience to figure out if you're a good investor. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's wild. Like I find myself wondering a lot how many of the wrong lessons I learned over the past, like, I don't know, six, six years or whatever. But then I honestly think that I think I've learned a lot of the, like the right lessons too. Um, like I came into this and I fully believe in value as a factor. Like if you want to turn that over to a computer and you want to make the argument to me that like the trashiest of trash is like overly hated and as a bucket it works i'm down to have that discussion and i that appeals to me like i used to think i was the guy that could find that and that i had the emotional fortitude that the market didn't have and um i think i was lying to myself a decent amount i mean i i think you and i know cable reasonably well and even this period to look at people and be like, oh, yeah, I'm not questioning whether or not I'm wrong because the stocks are down fucking 70%. Like, I'm not sure what I'm missing, right? Like, owning Charter and having it the worst stock in the S&P, that is not fun, even if you think you're right. No. One of the hardest things for me is, as someone who actively tries to be a business owner and a long-term investor, is thinking about poor results in the short term and trying to decipher in any way what's noise and what's a signal. It's very, very, very difficult to do. And I don't have a great way for even thinking about it today. One thing I have started to lean on more than I probably did in the past is looking for managers and management teams where I think they actually can try to put themselves in the best position possible to basically try to find a path forward. Um, but even judging people is also very difficult, just like judging businesses and where they might be in five or 10 years. It's a very difficult thing to do. And in terms of actually managing a portfolio, it's been instructive for me in a way where when I was younger, a stock price goes down and, you know, the probably the most notable example is like, hey, the stock price is down 20, but I think intrinsic value is down 10 or something. So it's even more attractive. And I've just learned to, in those situations, to actually wait for the business to turn once again before just buying into what could be a whole, I mean, I think you and I have talked about this a bunch, the John Hempton post on, you know, losers average down and his kind of approach. And a lot of these things are just very arbitrary, but I think his approach to risk management makes a lot of sense in, in terms of basically just giving yourself a cap, which this is, I'm, al I'm allowed to spend, I think he said basically 900 basis points. Like that's the most I can spend. And he also had a, a time condition on it in terms of when he could make additional purchases, forcing the business results to kind of shine through. And I think you can really get into a dangerous place if you don't have any constraints on it. And you just say, every time this thing goes down, I'm just as convicted as I was before, if not more so because it's cheaper, I'm just going to buy into every dip. And you find yourselves in a position where you have a very large allocation to something that you may very well be wrong on. I mean, the market is not stupid. <laughs> it usually, I mean, I've said this to you about cable for a long time, right? These stocks always traded at a discount. I think the market's always sniffed out certain risks in terms of what wireless could potentially become, especially for a certain type of customer. And now we're 
we're seeing that reality at least play out in a certain way. Now, whether or not it's going to, you know, have 10 million plus subscribers over time is still to be seen. But I think the market probably rightly sniffed out some of the technological risk that is a real part of this business. Yeah, you know, uh, my favorite part about cable is uh, I used to be amped that it was the best network that it was competing against, right? And now uh, I find myself pitching, well, it's the best value. It may not be <laughs> like a superior tech to fiber, but it's the best value. Uh, and if that's not thesis creep, I don't know what is. On the other hand, cable is such a good example because I've said to you in, in the past that if I'm wrong on this, I'm wrong on everything, right? Like this is the thing I think I know. <laughs> Uh, and I, and I think those kind of statements are bound to bite you in the ass eventually. But, um, like I still have not seen evidence that I and we, I mean, we have similar opinions are wrong on that thesis. I think objectively, you know, my mistake, at least, uh, you know, when everything was ripping, I should not have traded out of charter and Altice, but you know, some of that's hindsight, uh, some of that was bad work, and some of that's probably just a lesson to carry forward. I think where I'm at on that particular idea right now is they buy in so many shares that, like, I'm just going to let that be my buyback. Yeah. But, man, if we are now five years forward and cable is what we think it is, and I didn't bet it here... I'm going to be fucking mad at myself, <laughs> you know, and I, and I yeah. have bet it. I mean, it's a real position. Continuing to own, it's betting it. Yes. And, and it's not small, right? Like, I mean, by average size, it's, some people out there run like crazy concentration. I'm not smart enough to do that stuff, but for me, it's a real bet lately, less real, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, like, I mean, if charter continues to buy in 12% of their shares, I should own a decent more percentage of that company when it's all said and done. So I don't know. How, 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 yeah. does, how does Buffett look at this in your opinion? Well, let me start with how I look at it because it's a less informed way of yes. <laughs> investing than Buffett. But just taking a step back on the business, first of all, before stepping into the buyback part, you know, I think Comcast ripped off 12 or 13 years of a million plus net ads in the broadband business. And if you went back, you know, 18 months ago and said, hey, if this thing is, you know, flat to down on net ads and broadband, does that break your thesis? And I think you'd probably say yes, or you'd at least say it has serious concerns. You know, when it happens in real time, there's a bunch of moving parts right now, whether it's, you know, COVID pull forward, mover churn, FWA potentially being something that has a capped limit in terms of how big it can become. I think those are all reasonable points to make, but my point is that, you know, setting these rules kind of in advance, especially if you're talking about something that applies to just a quarter or a year, it's too limiting to some extent, but it does help you to say, you know, I'm going to set these rules at, at the outset. And if that thing happens, I don't really care what the reason is that's, you know, outside of something that's very directly attributable to the problem, like a complete change in macro in an advertising business like that would obviously be a bit different, but because it'd be so short term in nature, but you know, you could do it that way. You know, again, I think about it more in position sizing than anything else at these at this point. And, you know, with the buyback being so substantial and it's a, you know, a charter, it's a levered equity strategy, basically. I just think I have to tell myself I have to be happy with the fact that they're buying my equity interest in this company is increasing without me buying more. And again, going back to like that Hempton way of thinking, to me, it, it probably leads to a lower number being the cap on how much I allow myself to purchase. And if we're actually right on the business and they can buy back a lot of shares at current valuations, it's going to work very well over the next, you know, five to 10 years. And I think you just have to be happy with that in terms of how you position size it. I think Buffett, you know, it's funny, as you and I were discussing this past week, I had never seen this before that Buffett wrote in the, I think it was a 98 letter that maybe it was a couple of years after that, that he had not bought or sold a share of Coke since 94. And I was looking around that time and it was 30% plus of the equity book. Like in terms of the position size, it was a massive position. And I kept looking at the numbers and realized he hasn't bought, jumping to today, 2022, he has never bought or sold a share of Coca-Cola since 1994. 
it's nowhere near nearly as big as a percentage of the book because the equity the equity book has grown so much over time. But it's just fascinating to me to think that, you know, during that 10 year period from 94 to 03, I think it was, it was 30% of the book the entire time. And he never touched it once. And expensive, wasn't it? And expensive. I mean, yes. And he doesn't do anything with it, right? He didn't do anything with it. Now, granted, he was corporate on- taxes have something to do with that. Taxes have something to do with it. That one was a unique situation in some ways because he was on the board and certainly knew the people involved. And I mean, he knew Dion, he knew Don Keo like personally. He lived, they lived in the same neighborhood, so he he may have been a little skittish about things in that regard. But I also think he kind of said, you know, as you made the point on taxes, I think on an after tax ba- tax basis, he probably said over a long enough period of time, I'm happy to own this business, and I'm surely I'm sure he thought the predictability of that business was at a high enough, it crossed a certain bar for him where he was okay with saying, you know, yeah, I'm going to get multiple fade on this thing over a period of time. But I think the, on a, on, you know, a net number, I'm going to do okay here. So I, again, I think it really, that example for me, it really just comes back to the business and thinking about the long-term growth trajectory. And, you know, on cable, you have to ask yourself that question. What's the addressable market? Is it Broadband homes is is a, the, the wireless part of the business now something that's clearly additive, which in my mind, I think it is. I completely missed it early on. Francisco was telling me it's more important than it is. I was just, in my mind, it was, you know, this is basically a different version of pay TV. Yeah, it helps a bundle, but you don't make money doing this ever. And I think now I see much more clearly and with his help that this is part of a much bigger connectivity strategy and, you know, whether or not M&A can happen in that space, I don't know, but I think cable is very well positioned for, for where this goes over time, but it is a competitive market. And, you know, as with all these things, your competitors, when you don't have a product that's completely differentiated, your competitors actions can impact your business in a very meaningful way. So if wireless runs a strategy that does not generate attractive returns, that certainly could have an impact on cable. So we're going to have to wait and see. Yeah, I agree. For those that don't listen over and over again to my disclaimer, this shit is not investment advice. It is the opinion of uh, Alex and I and do your own work. Um, So I I guess, uh, you know, the thing that's wild to me about cable, and it's funny, I I mean, I I guess I knew it, but uh, today I was reading a note that sort of illuminated it, right? the inability for a wireless company to sell a bundle throughout their entire footprint versus cable who can sell the Comcast, like Comcast, I have Comcast mobile. I I think it's as fine as any mobile product that I've had. Uh, I was an ex Sprint user, which basically didn't work in rural areas. (laughs) So, uh, you know, but, but what Comcast is on, on Verizon, right there. It's the MVNO. The, ability for them to attack Verizon using its own infrastructure throughout their entire footprint is different from Verizon being able to bundle because, you know, they got national coverage, right? And Mm -hmm. they only have so much um, fiber. It makes the marketing of Verizon's bundle very difficult. And I think, uh, I think that's a real issue, um, and I and you know just listen to AT and T to get today, and I'm sure cable earnings are going to absolutely suck, and we're going to get punched in the face because why not? But you know, just listen to AT and T, and they're going to push the wireless pricing. They're they're going after ARPU, like which is average revenue uh, per user for those that don't know. I think that wireless is in a tough spot, and. The wild card in all this is T-Mobile, but I'm not convinced that I've seen anything that makes me think that the physics of T-Mobile's market makes sense at maturity. On the other hand, a lot of what I read is cable bulls, right? So, like, am I a fish in a bowl that can't see, you know, that I'm in a bowl or whatever. I don't know what the analogy that I'm trying to say is, (laughs) right? But, like, how much of it's that I don't know what I don't know and how much of it's reality. And I think figuring that out in real time is really difficult. And, you know, you read, like, Cable Cowboy, and Cable has gone through these 
periods where people are like, oh, it's going to die, it's going to die, and it survived. And reading about those periods and living those periods are like such different feelings. Yeah, for sure. You know, one thing I think I can say pretty confidently is that the average American has no interest in changing their wireless provider or their broadband provider unless there's a very good reason to do so. Um, you know, you can think about price differentials, quality of service, et cetera. You know, I, I, I saw T-Mobile was running ads recently for their fixed wireless offering and, you know, home internet offering, and they were advertising the $50 a month price point, which again, this is not, this is not very different from the ARPUs that you're seeing at a at Comcast or a Charter. It's, it's not, in my mind, a dollar amount difference that's going to make the average person consider switching service, which by the way, you know, T-Mobile's offering is only in certain geographies is based on where they have excess capacity on their network. And it's funny in my mind that they were advertising the $50 price point because they have a more attractive offering. The only problem is that it only applies to, you know, the Magenta Max, like the highest tier wireless customers at T-Mobile. So it just kind of speaks to the nature of, to the point you kind of made, like, the geographic slash marketing kind of area that they have to weave through in order to get people to find out about this. Obviously, if you have an advertisement about something on TV and somebody goes and pull it up for their area and the service isn't even available, you know, that that's going to ding you in terms of whether or not they're going to consider the product again down the road. So, you know, I don't, I don't certainly don't think it's all roses for, for cable, but I think their position with the MVNO you know, the opportunities that they have with offloading in terms of just picking spots in the network to basically arbitrage where it would make sense to in terms of the ROI they'll get from doing so. I think they're in a pretty strong position and, you know, they have opportunities potentially in video. And I, I just think having the best product, at least relative to what a fixed wireless offering will get you, I think it positions them pretty well outside of somebody coming in at a price point that's very significantly below the ARPUs that they charge and doing so in a way where the customer, you know, thinks it's basically a good enough offering. And I don't have any reason to believe at this point, based on everything I've read, that they can truly do it at scale. You know, on the flip side of the coin, cable's done pretty well in wireless so far in terms of sub ads, you know, talking with people like you has confirmed some of the fears I had anyways. And I think especially in the case of Comcast, I think they've even hinted at this at some points on the conference call that their ability to actually sell these things together and to service these relationships in a way that's really well done for the customer is, is certainly not where it needs to be. And Dude, that's, it sucks. Yeah. It fucking sucks. Like yeah. I moved Comcast mobile doesn't know that I moved. I gotta get in order. To, first of all, to be fair to Comcast, my broadband and mobile right now is super cheap. And like, I have plenty of, of bandwidth. My only beef with them is I have a fair amount of upload capacity because I have this podcast and I don't have symmetrical upload download. But like, I don't need a gig. That's way over what I need. But I do need more than 10 megs, uh, you know, whatever. The inability of that company to talk to itself when you're moving is insane so i got an email that was like you should you know here's your bill i click my bill and it's a blank page okay cool <laughs> now i gotta call them right now i'm on the phone and i'm like why can't i even see my bill 35 minutes go past i say this isn't worth it okay i call back do it again finally i'm in the airport and i had a six hour delay and i was like i'm gonna take care of this shit so I get a guy on the phone and he's like, oh, well, we just didn't know that you moved. And there's like some internal problem with our, our system and you got to have a broadband connection in order to pull up your bill. I was like, I have one. Uh, long story short, it's like, how the fuck don't your systems talk to each other? Yeah. <laughs> They're like two totally separate organizations. But, you know, once I got through that, it, it really is a fine product and I really am paying like nothing for the bundle relative to what I would be paying otherwise. So like how mad am I really? I don't know. Is it super annoying every time I have to talk to their customer service? Yeah, I hate it. And I've moved a lot in the last five years. So I've had to talk to them a lot more than I would like to. But it is a really good product. It's something that I know I can depend on. If I have a problem in my home, I'm almost certain it's my Wi-Fi because that's the weak point. I've got it wired to my home. And 
you know, honestly, I don't have many other choices where I live. Um, and I didn't in Chicago and I think it's a pretty good product. So, you know, we'll see. It's, uh, but man, it is fucking hard to watch a stock go that hard against you and not wonder what am I missing? And then you got Wells and Oppenheimer out here with like uber bearish takes. I think Charter would push back pretty hard on those. And then who was, uh, who did the, somebody did really deep work like two weeks ago. Was it Credit Suisse or no? Uh, it could have been them. Yeah. yeah I think it might have been. That was a really good report, which was like confirmation porn for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, you got uh, a, uh, a certain boutique research firm that I think very highly of, uh, Moffat Nathanson, that sometimes I'm lucky enough to see some stuff from. And, uh, you know, so it's like, which, which fighters do you have, right? You have Credit Suisse and Moffat Nathanson, uh, a division of Silicon Valley Bank, or do you have, uh, you know, Wells and Oppenheimer? And I don't know, man. I asked, uh, who's the dude from uh, First Pacific? He, he was a... Uh, um, the future proof event, but I asked him, it was on Meb Faber's podcast and anyone that, that checks out Meb's podcast can find out. And I, I really liked his answer. Cause I said like, when do you think you're wrong given where the stock is today? Cause we're talking about like below COVID lows now. Mm -hmm. And his answer was, you know, we have KPIs, right? We have a thesis, we've got KPIs and that's what we watch. And I, I thought that that was, uh, that was like a really awesome answer. Uh, to hear. And I think it's the right answer. Yeah. Where it gets really messy is, you know, again, like cable is a perfect example. You, you look at the COVID pull forward and what we're seeing now in the back end, depending how you look at those numbers, I think you can make a really compelling, especially if you consider something like mover churn, you can make a really compelling case that a very significant percentage of this is purely that all washing out. Now, it's even hard in hindsight for me to explain why some of these, I mean, across different businesses, not just cable, but it's hard for me to explain why certain things happened during the, the pandemic. And now why you're seeing, you know, the other side of the curve basically, but just purely from the numbers, I think you can make that argument. It's funny. I, I wrote something recently where I essentially said, I said, I've come more to the idea that in the short term, I certainly won't let price drive my decision making or my views on views on, you know, the long term prospects for a business. In some ways I'm willing to even let the business results be a little bit more flexible than than might seem, you know, reasonable at first glance. And it kind of goes to something that you and I have, have discussed before, especially as it relates to Buffett. The idea of I think we talked about it with KHC might have been the name. I'm not sure it might have been another one, but this is the idea of laying a bet and saying the bet is the bet and I'll reassess in five years. You know, he, it, it, as it relates to KC specifically talked about when Kraft sold, I think it was Kraft sold their, their frozen pizza business to Nestle. He's like, I, he specifically said on CNBC, like, we'll, we'll see in five years how that decision kind of turned out. Like I think more and more for me, if I'm going to have mistakes, it's going to be that I look back in five years and the thesis hasn't panned out, but I'm not going to get myself caught in a situation where, there's a three month period where it's like, this doesn't make any sense to me. It's kind of crazy what's happening right now. What's going on. I'm just going to get out and wait for it to clear. It's just, it's just not the way I, it doesn't align with kind of who I am as a person and who I'm trying to be as an investor. And I it, like anything, there's pros and cons obviously to that approach. But for me, it's the thing that I, I think most aligns with what I'm trying to do. And, you know, obviously when those things are happening as well, probably goes without saying that during those periods, the stock prices are typically under pressure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it, that can get taken too far, but I, I think more and more, I think, I think Jeff Gannon wrote something about this years ago where he I like basically said like, yeah, he, he's, he's, I, I wish. Shout I mean, out he, to Andrew Kuhn too. He's thank, thankfully. Yeah. Andrew certainly helped with getting Jeff back out there again. Cause it is as output, at least from what I could see was Jeff's got to come on the pod. Andrew, if you're listening, get his yes. ass on the pod. Please. Nah, I've been texting with Andrew trying to get him on. Uh, yeah, he was someone I was reading. I think when I first some of this started. is my fault. I, I know I haven't been good at scheduling. I apologize to the listeners and the people that I've been trying to schedule with. I've got some shit going on in my life. 
and uh, <laughs> some, some, but I'm I think I'm fully back, or at least seventy eight percent back. Uh, so that that should get cleaned up in the future. But so Jeff used to write a lot. He used to write a lot, and he's has, he's a very he's I think his he's a good investor and a good analyst, but I think he's also a very good writer. And I think and and I won't put words in his mouth, but I think what he said one time is that he essentially operates from the perspective of if I buy something, there's zero uh, percent chance I'm selling it within the first year after buying it. Like yeah, that's that's the kind of way that he thinks about stuff. And I think that's the for me that's air quotes you know the right way to kind of operate because it. It impacts your decision making. It it changes everything, really. Well, that's some guy spear stuff too, yeah. right? With the with the two year hold period. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff is, you know, your conversation with Chris Chris Cerrone and how Acri approaches stuff. Like it, it's a seemingly small change that impacts every single part of research, managing a position after you buy it. You know, adding more potentially trimming selling out completely I, it, it impacts everything when you change the lens from thinking about stuff in terms of where's my best IRR over whatever select period of time that you choose to finding great businesses and in my mind management teams and businesses are like somewhat indistinguishable over a long enough period of time you have to have both but finding those things and then changing the question to like when would I have to sell not because of valuation because the business is actually changing. And I think sometimes the unsatisfactory answer is that you actually need a few years to see whether or not it's breaking. Yeah. It's, it's very hard. I mean, to the conversation in that interview, you know, you were asking about him about DG versus Dollar Tree, a dollar general versus Dollar Tree. And I think the point was very fair when you were asking him. And I, it's funny in hindsight, I think what Dollar Tree's done in the past nine to 12 months with the price hike to 125 from it, the, for people who don't know, they basically it's the baseline price point in the stores from a dollar to a dollar 25 across buck 25 tree doesn't roll off the uh, <laughs> tongue no, as well. The name might not sound as good, but I was in a dollar tree yesterday and, and as you know, I've, I've written about the company before their merchandising mix is very unique. The products they offer are very different from, you know, for people like us in the Southeast, what you would find at a Publix, especially the price points are very different it will work at that price point. And I think basically trying to heap praise on them because I think they rightly assessed that the Dollar Tree banner is a very good business. I think they made the right, the right yeah. assessment in that case. Yeah, where, Dollar Tree is great. Where the situation got in a bit of trouble, as he said during the conversation, is the family dollar stuff. And, yeah. I don't you know, know family dollar. What's that like? It's much more comparable to Dollar General, but it does not have the same geographic uh, uh, characteristics to the business. So, interesting. you know, it competes more in my mind. I mean, not the whole footprint, obviously, but they certainly have more stores on a percentage basis that compete you're with more like urban, your Walgreens Amazon. and yeah, your CVSs and regional grocers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just more competitive in that nature where DG is in my mind, it's, you know, it's a rural grocery store effectively. And that they're actually, you know, expanding how much of the grocery basket Dude, they can serve over time. Dollar That's, general is like their exteriors are so nice. If you drive America and you go through like Appalachia and you really drive it, like their locations are so good. Yeah. I don't know how many they can do, but like I've been in the sticks of Wisconsin and one has popped up and I've been like, that's a nice store. And then I look at it, it's Dollar General. We got a couple around here. I think there's some real competition around here. Uh, this is not nearly as rural as... as like Amazon's coming to my house every day. I'm not sure. living in the sticks, but like there's a, they really have a real estate division that is yeah. world class. Yeah. You know, and the hard thing is when you own something like that, you know, I, I to your conversation before about kind of, you know, tr traditional value investing, it's when you come to that conclusion about the business, how do you start to think about what a, a multiple that makes sense is right. Like you could, you could operate from the perspective of, well, I buy it at 15 times and I'm going to sell it. If it's at 18 or 20 or, or I'm going to comp at the dollar tree. And if the spreads more than, you know, five turns, well then now dollar tree is the better investment than DG is. Yeah. And of course it's certainly applicable to have those discussions and think about that. But I, I think you can also start from the perspective of, of filtering for the business has to pass a certain bar and, you know, 
best in an industry probably would be a reasonable bar to make as part of that uh, decision making process. And, you know, you still have to worry about and think about valuation from there. But for me, I just find that aligns so much more with where I'm at now than where I probably was, you know, certainly five years ago and maybe even a couple of years ago. And that might, that might also be partly a lesson of <laughs> this crazy run or seemingly crazy run that we've had, um, you know, over the past couple of years, which now looks like it, it may have ended, but we talk all the time about cable and other names. And it's funny, we never talk about Microsoft and Berkshire and other stuff that we both own where, you know, yeah, the multiple can come in in the short term, but I think we're very, very confident on the businesses and the management teams over long periods of time. And so I just try to find more and more and just yeah. avoid the other stuff, not get sucked into situations where you can back into justifying doing it because it's cheap enough. Well, you know, something I was obviously super public on was Curate. And that business was so interesting because I was so focused on the consumer habit. And look, I think I will go to the mat saying that that was a good bet to make when I made it. I think that there is a very reasonable case to be made that I should have sold when, you know, it was like 12, right? I think when I underwrote it or whatever, I was telling you, I thought like nine bucks was uh, on the higher end of fair value or whatever. But, you know, that business was humming, like humming. And how quickly it changed from everything is going well to we're having problems obtaining shoulder inventory and supply chains are hurting our model. There were things about that business that the, um, what's the way to say this? I, I think that the cards that came out on the table exposed things that I didn't even know the questions existed to ask, if that makes sense. Because the business had not faced supply chain difficulty like it did and then the fire in that warehouse like really sucked and you know shout out to my man Rollinson I I hope David turns out I think they're doing the right things I you know we'll see I don't own it I own some preferred shares in my trading account uh my my IRA because I apparently hate my IRA <laughs> uh, but you know like I look I like the people at Liberty I like David um but I I just think uh it exposed this element of when you're investing in these businesses that are somewhat fragile stuff can go wrong and and maybe this is true in my perception of anti-fragile businesses or businesses that are uh, much higher quality. But, like, things can go wrong that make things go really fucking wrong. Yeah. Like, cable, if it goes wrong, you're talking about... Look, it's, the stock is not going to work. I'm not, I'm not saying you can go X growth or lose subs and things are going to be rosy. That's not the point. But the business is not going to hemorrhage subs overnight. Right. Curate went from this is insane to this is really bad in two quarters. Yeah. And that that was wild to watch and to be um I guess so close to and to care so much about it um I don't know, that was a really good lesson for me. Yeah, it's a funny one. From I, I was involved in the situation as well. For anybody who hasn't, you know, yeah, read but something you I sold at it. the right time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I only ever found out about it because you and Mike and I, I completely agree with you. Like at the time that we, or at least when I did, I think you guys placed it before me, so you might have even had you know better pricing. You know, I think it seemed like a very reasonable bet, and you know, it was fortuitous slash lucky on selling at a really good time as well. It's a really hard one for me because I don't even know if I step back and assess like was it was it a good idea was it smart when I try to apply it to my framework of how I think about investing generally it could be something completely different from what I do I, like I appreciate that but I'm also trying to stay in my lane and try to find a game that I can win at over time and I really I I really struggle to answer that question honestly like what was it a good idea and you know, it, fuck it, you. It was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it might've been. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But that comment also gets to the way that I kind of 
manage my portfolio and the way I size positions. And th- like, I, I, I take the Munger idea to heart of like, you buy, you know, obviously not in the same geographic region, but you buy a handful of businesses. If you own a handful of businesses throughout the country that are well run and they're good businesses and you paid seemingly reasonable prices, like that's plenty of diversification. It's kind of how I, I think about it. And it's harder when, when I kind of stray outside of that framework of doing, th- I, did, I, I it just works so much better for me given how I'm in a position size thing and things and the expectation of being around for a long time that I just stick away. Like even, you know, Twitter ARB situation, ATV ARB situation, like these things can all be perfectly sound ideas, maybe even great ideas. But I find myself more and more comfortable with the conclusion of it's great for other people to do those things and to make money from doing them. And I can not care. I don't, yeah. I don't have to do these other things. Yeah. We talked about this today for sure. Cause I struggle 100%. enough doing what I'm trying to do. Well, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I will go to the grave uh, and maybe this, cause I love it too much and fine. You know, human minds have bias. I, I'll go to the grave saying you give me Greg Maffei as a capital allocator and curate bringing in that much cash flow with that market cap that's a good bet to make. And my evidence for why it was a good bet to make is even as as wrong as that went, I ended up down a negligible amount post-tax. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you can have what my perception of a catastrophic result is and still not lose money, that's a good bet. For sure, yeah. However, you know, it's interesting to watch a business like Google go through a pandemic that can throw a thousand different curveballs at it and it just morphs in real time. Yeah. Or you watch a business like Berkshire go through the pandemic and like, okay, cool. Geico has to rebate customers because it made too much money because too fewer people were driving <laughs> and like, I don't know, some other part of the business picks up steam and like then BNSF comes roaring back and like you just watch how that machine works and it's like, okay, well, you know, one is really truly anti-fragile. The other is fragile with a good valuation. So if you're going to stack your chips and put them in on the table and like position size something, how do you really want to position size it? And, And the reason I never really bet Twitter hard was uh, this merger our position hard. First of all, to the people that listen that, that were long, like mad respect to you guys. But I just kind of felt like if something wonky happened, you don't have two ways out, right? You got one way out. So even if I was like, cause I, I played it for a bit, even if I was right on the call, there's like weird shit that could happen. And all of a sudden I'm down like 50%. And I'm not trying to bet like money that could actually change my family's life on that. Yeah. When I told you even at the time when you were doing it, I was like, I obviously I was partly joking, but I was like, if you're going to do it, cause you know, stock prices were down a good, a lot, maybe they're even lower now. So <laughs> yeah, no, the <laughs> opportunity imagine. cost of the bet was real. It wasn't like we were 2021. Right. And this is some random opportunity to make 45%. Like there's real opportunity cost of that bet. Now in retrospect, it was the right bet to make and shout out to yeah. the longs, but, but I think we specifically discussed Netflix. And I think I said something to you like, you got to promise me if you're going to do this, if the, if you're going to do the Twitter arm and it works out, you have to promise me since you want to buy Netflix at X price, yeah. you'll roll the money into it. Cause it, that's where for me, again, it gets and I away think, from what like, was Netflix trading at when we had that discussion. That's a good question. Like 200 ish. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It's hard to know when that was now, but, but yeah, point being like, you know, it's, it's these offshoots that get you away. I, I just more and more go back to like, just trying to, really find one thing to do and try to do it well. And again, it's hard enough to do one thing really well. And I don't want to miss out on potential ideas that I really like and things I really want to own for the long term because I'm, again, the curate situation worked well, but I wouldn't want to have capital there because, and this is a, you know, something that it's just like a personality thing. It's the way I want to operate. And I think it's certainly, it certainly impacts thoughts on, you know, position sizing and, and everything, but as an investor, I, I think it's really important to actually figure that stuff out for you. What is the game you're trying to play? Are you going to do a little bit of everything? Even the idea of, you know, having an account that is like, hey, this is kind of more of a play account. And I have a real account where 
I'm only operating in one style here. I've always thought that it's so easy to, to trade. I mean, especially a lot of people in this game are very, very smart. As you and I both know, we talk to a lot of these people and they're, a lot of them are very, very intelligent, but I think intelligent people also have a blind spot in thinking that they don't fall into the holes other people fall into. Yeah. And I try to do what I can to avoid that. And I'm sure I still fall in the holes anyways, but for me, it's something I truly think about a good amount. Well, I've told you about my, my current like account that matters, right? Like, I don't even know the password. <laughs> I have no idea what my weightings are. I, I don't know how the stocks are performing. Somebody pinged me on a stock that I owned uh, the other day, and I was like, dang, that thing's gotten murdered. And I had no idea, right? Because back like uh, a couple months ago, I was looking at my uh, account on Fidelity all the time, and I, it, it was like fucking with my mind. So I moved it over uh, to another place, and um, I, I, I don't even know. Like, I have no idea it's a modern, what my portfolio looks like right now. It's a modern now. coffee can portfolio, brokerage account you got locked up. You don't yeah. have a password, too. I mean, look, this is some <laughs> this is some retail bag holder shit, too, right? Where, like, retail doesn't look... Uh, like, I get it, but also, I tried to tie myself to the mass post with it because there was... Uh, on, on the way up, I was checking it too much and feeling greed and excitement. And on the way down, I was feeling too much panic and fear. And I was just like, I need to get back to like the stuff that I know matters. And to me, that means looking a lot less. And the way that I could do that, because I'm like an infant in my mind, is to just like send it away. And I I, I don't have a clue what I own, right? I mean, I know the names, yeah. but I don't know the weights. Yeah, it's smart. I don't, I, I look at. When I go in and trade, which as people who subscribe to my service know is very infrequently when I go in and trade or when I do a quarter end, you know, portfolio update with returns and everything, that's when I look. And outside of that, I do not pull up fidelity basically at all. I just, I mean, I'm the same way. And again, the only way I know how to do it is to, I'm the same with Twitter. I don't have the app on my phone. I literally can't have it on my phone <laughs> yeah. or, or else I'll be, I mean, I still go to the browser a decent amount, which I try to squash, but I literally can't have the app with notifications on, on my phone. I'll be a crazy person. I mean, the nice thing about uh, my approach in this market is I only cry like once every three months or whatever, <laughs> uh, as opposed to every day yeah. uh, as I get shat on. I will say to those that are interested in Curate, my interpretation of the situation, I don't know how it defies uh, what I would project, but minutes watched continue to climb. They're at all time highs. It's fascinating. I think it's a sales conversion issue. Uh, the people that I talk to, also think it's a sales conversion issue. Apparently, David has changed the incentives over there to uh, incentivize the sales force to um, get a better, uh, a wider breadth of offerings because I think they got away from the daily uh, special value, which I, you know, I mean, I agree with. Like, if you're going to offer the same thing every day, or and they they weren't, but. If you're going to get lazy and you offer it four times a month, it's no longer some special value. It's just kind of like an offering. And and I think David has incentivized people in the right way to the, you know, to the extent I know. And I, and I really hope that that business turns around. I don't know why I love that business so much, but it's my favorite business by far. I, and I know that people love like great businesses. I walked in to my grandma's house the other day and for the first time I saw it on and they were keeping her company and that may be exactly who they they exist to serve, but damn it, if she doesn't deserve to be kept company. And uh, this is we'll like see. A, I hope it. I hope it uh, makes a transition. This is a comment slash question for you. And the, the thing you just mentioned about what they started doing in a way that you know I think you would say and I would say that it's probably not aligned with the actual value add that they you know bring to their customers. Do you think in the case of Curate and maybe Charter as well, do you think the financial leverage has been pushed to too much of an extreme where it made them kind of susceptible to ex exogenous or, you know, changes in industry structure and in industry trends in a way that was too aggressive or, Hey, that's just a reality of life. And if things, I, I mean, I'm going to go off the top of my head, but what's Charter's uh, weighted average maturity? Like 13 and a half years? It's long out there, yeah. Right, and their weighted it's average long. cost of debt is four, six. If that's not sensible, what they've structured, I don't know what like, it is. Like, why wouldn't you do that, right? So, <laughs> it seems very sensible, right. and, the structure and now, of it. And now if you're going to attack Charter, you're paying labor more and your cost of debt's higher. 
uh, and Charter's got infrastructure in the ground now. Can you argue should have those dollars been uh, leveraged to put fiber in the ground and not like essentially recap the business? Yeah, probably you could make that argument. I think if I were going to debate John Malone on how to run a cable plant, <laughs> I would need to have uh, a pretty good... I think he understands taking care of the plant first and returning capital second. With regards to Curate, I think that it's important to remember when looking at a security. Like, Curate gave Malone the money to buy Charter. And this is an asset, like, at the end of the life cycle. And the debt is not particularly restrictive, but I also think, like, you know, could that business probably wear less leverage? Yeah. I guess the most direct way to say it is I think that if if you invest with Liberty, I think you're investing in a private equity uh, public fund. And I think a lot of people like to say I take a private equity approach to public markets. I think Liberty actually does it. And I think that there is the risk when you are taking that strategy that you get outflanked. I have thought for a while that Sirius XM had that same risk and like Spotify was outflanking them. And as I continue to watch Sirius XM execute, I continue to be impressed with it. Mm -hmm. And I continue to be impressed with the life of these assets. So to the extent that it is true that Curate actually has minutes watched growing, I think my perception of what the market thinks I think that's wrong on Curate. I do think they have some very real problems there where if you look at the growth relative to retail sales, like why does it lag so much? Why do sales per minute watched lag? Like those are very real questions, but I'm not sure it's a leverage question. And to be clear, like some businesses leverage or not are just going to go through the life cycle. Like they're just going to die. It's, it's, I, I kind of mean it more so in, in terms of, you know, we've talked about this a million times with, you see it in, you know, dying retailers or a lot of value names really where, you know, the cash you're paying a little multiple on, it could be on a cash flow metric or an earnings metric, but your ability to actually get the cash back can be significantly constrained given the incentives of the yeah, people yeah. running it. But that's what I love about Liberty. Right. That is is one reason I like investing in them, right? Like when you were investing in Curate, you knew that cash was coming back to you. You can say what you want about how they lever things. You can say what you want about their reinvestment to pivot. You can say all that shit. At the end of the day, Greg Maffei and John Malone understand getting capital back to shareholders. They are the only reason I would have made the Curate bet. If they were not involved, I would not have made that bet. And I'm simply saying on the flip side that excess significant leverage yeah. puts you in a position where you could consider doing things like running today's special value, you know, multiple times in terms of driving, you know, you can, you can start to become really focused on short-term numbers potential. And again, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, no, try- no, that's kind of an interesting point. I'm not trying to make this specific to them. No, no, that's a, no. Just, well, I don't care. Let's make it specific to them. Well, well they're to not be clear. Yeah. I own the Liberty broadband. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they're the, look, those, the girls over there know that I love them. Shane and Courtney, what's up? Uh, and uh, they're free to come on the pod and, re- you know, rebut anything we say, right? Um, we're just talking. And we could even say the same thing, just to give another example, you know, as we're seeing now, significantly declining stock prices at businesses. I mean, as Francisco was telling me today, like Snap's run rate, SBC is like north of a billion dollars a year and the market cap is now getting to like a $10 billion range. Yeah. I mean, these businesses have very real reason to care about maybe directly the stock price or, you know, short-term financial results in a way that. I don't think that's Liberty. I really don't. Fair. I would encourage people that are interested to call them because I, I think they will, I, well, I'm, fairly certain they will pick up your phone call and they'll talk to you, especially now, because I doubt they're getting as many calls as they used to. But like, I think what probably happened there, I think people got bonused out on a scheme. 
that drove sales and maybe didn't drive uh, diversity of sales, right, from a product standpoint. Mm -hmm. To the extent that incentives matter, I think that maybe the incentives got a little bit lazy. And I think that maybe it's possible that uh, the CEO change, as much as I think um, Mike did a good job at like watching the data, I think maybe fresh eyes can change some of what was going on. Because for a long time, they've said, like, we don't have a minute's watch problem. But the sales have not told you the same story. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. I, I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. Again, it's another really hard one because you had... As, as we both know, I mean, we were laying... It defies logic why their minutes... why Like, their minutes watched are higher than they've ever been, right? Yeah. I mean, as, assuming they're telling the truth, which how could you not assume that? Uh, anyone that wants to prove otherwise, good luck. Yeah, even with them playing in the right demos for linear TV, it is amazing to think that, you know, the bundles maybe 20% below its peak in terms of the number of households yeah. <laughs> out there. That is, it's very impressive. And they have successfully pivoted, right? In the past, there was the, you know, DirecTV is going to come, you're going to get 200 channels. Why is anyone going to find this? They have figured out a way to go through that. So I think that, that there is a non-insignificant probability that they have figured out how to manage the distribution aspect of everything. I also think there's a non-insignificant po- probability that uh, the incentives got kind of fucked up. And, you know, we'll see. I, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know in the common. If I if I was certain, you know, the common is trading in nothing right now, right? So I, w- I would yeah. buy that. Uh, and the preferred is yielding 17 or whatever. And the bonds are yielding quite a bit too. So my bet within the Liberty Complex is charter right now. So, yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I probably Joking. just cursed it. No. Joking. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, diverting this conversation a little bit. And by the way, now that we're an hour in, if you've stuck with us, uh, I'm going to probably pour some more wine. But damn it, what were we talking about? Why did I get lost? Probably because I'm a little drunk. I don't know what we were talking about. I can't remember. <laughs> well, <laughs> talked about a lot of stuff. We have. <laughs> Um, the Munger Media. Oh, was the that top, it? <laughs> the top. Remember when I killed the market by interviewing uh, yeah. uh, Gardner? Yeah, yeah, David Gardner and uh, but Mark no. Mahaney. Yeah, that sucks. Can you believe I did that to people? Yeah, it was rough. You yeah, heard, you heard us bad. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I know you say this is financial advice, but I took it as financial advice. <laughs> well, apparently the entire market figured, you know, if some other moron with a podcast is going to interview these guys, it's time to short and good for the people that went short. But so, so now that everything's got rocked, let's talk about Mahaney's book and what do you what do you think about his general? And I'll I'll give you my version of the framework before we go in. I'd say at a high level, it's a it's a taking mind share, taking engagement, revenue growth approach to business. And especially in sectors or industries where there's clear, cha- I mean, the good examples would be, you know, advertising would be media, you know, names like Google, names like Netflix, obviously. I think Airbnb would probably fit into kind of the framework that he approaches Uber. things. Uber, Spotify. What- Spotify would fit in that bucket. I think he wrote about maybe all those names in the book. Definitely a handful of them. I mean, what's Spotify's market value right now? Net of cash and net of the ten cent investment. It's it's, not, it's lower than twenty for sure. Yeah, I think it's probably fourteen or thirteen. It might be down there. Yeah, it depends. I mean, the ten cent stake. I'd, it's eighty eighty two bucks a share or whatever. I, I bet like it's uh, yeah. eighty six something like that. Yeah, I, I bet it's like um, shit. I don't know. You think if you run that strategy over a long period of time that you it, well, it's seventeen billion gross. So yeah. what, three billion cash ish? I don't know off the top of my head. The ten cent stake's probably worth very. Let's little call it. Let's point. call it a thirteen billion dollar market cap. Yeah, net of everything. Yeah. Um. So you pick ten of these names. You equal weight them. What's their free cash flow? Do you know off the top of your head? I mean, we've been drinking. So I, don't I don't think don't it's know. very much. Yeah. <laughs> Are we accounting for stock based comp? Yeah, no? they got that Snapchat free cash flow. Yes. Um, I mean, first of all. I'm going to say what I'm going to say with the caveat of I am literally a guy that was put on a podcast because I think I'm moderately entertaining. And Mark Mahaney is like a real sell side analyst that's been around for a long time. Yeah, he does good work. Yeah, that's right. So he's legit and I am a dude. 
I think that Mark's framework of looking for underappreciated margin stories. I mean, I, I that's what I'm looking for in the industrial space right now. Mm-hmm. I just happen to like the industrial space r- rather than tech because I think that it's a space that people have not looked at over the past decade as much because it's underperformed. And I really think the in- Inflation Reduction Act has the possibility um, – to be like a very meaningful subsidy to corporations. And I think maybe the reason I think that is I watched what Obamacare did to the healthcare industry and how much like UNH ripped off that. And it would be a shame to miss that twice. Uh, I think that would be pretty fucking dumb. (laughs) So I think that there is a possibility that, some of the guys that have focused on tech have gotten lazy on valuation. But I also think that to disregard their framework is really stupid. I think, uh, you know, like Gardner, I I need to have him back on uh, because I know he'd do it and I think he deserves the chance. Well, I, I don't know what the hell he wants to with my audience. But anyway... I think a guy like that has a strategy that works over the really long term. I think the guy, the people that bail on that strategy now are fucked. No matter what strategy you run, you've got to stick through. And were his returns outsized because of rates? Yeah, probably. Do I think over the long term he's running something that's rational? Yeah, I do. And I think the same thing in Mahaney, right? I just think... um, you know, we came through a period where anyone that was doing anything that was uh, moderately related to tech, you know, was a fucking god. And uh, turns out it was a factor bet and probably a indirect interest rate bet. You know, it's it's fun. I was listening. I might have already mentioned this, but I was listening to the Cerrone podcast. Ocritus has a special place for me because of just how much I've learned from them over the past 10 years. Just, I mean, not... I've had a little bit of interaction with them personally just from basically last place I worked, but just studying how they operate and how how true business owner their approach is, just it, it just clicks with me in a huge way. But I was going to say, so I wrote a post a while ago, I don't defend this logic about Charlie Munger basically saying, you know, if I own something that's a valuation that is just too rich, I just won't sell it essentially. Well, look at what he did with BYD. Yeah. And even he said with with Google, he's or something else. Uh, I don't know what it was, but he was basically like, "Why would I sell it? It's got the greatest competitive position other than Google, right? Or or whatever." Like, I think that's a window into how he thinks. Well, and Cerrone put it in the perfect way when he said, "I do think it's Cerrone, by the way." I think it's Cerrone. <laughs> I don't think the E's hard. I think Is it's it? a hard E. No, I'm going to say Cerrone. Okay, well, do what you want. <laughs> I'll say Chris. How about that? <laughs> yes, that works. That works. <laughs> the guy who wrote the art of not selling. I'll call him that. That's right. <laughs> and he did say the art, not never sell. Yes. Which I, is a very important distinction. I think some of the wording in there is pretty direct, but we'll have to pull it up and give it a reread. But anyway, so he said he said during the podcast, which I think is 100% correct, but it kind of goes against some of the approaches of investing when he said the great businesses basically have a way of surprising you. Yeah. And it's, it's true. It's a, it's a hundred percent. And I'd say I'd add managers as well, because I think it's a massively important part of what a business actually becomes over time. And you can look at something like Amazon for the clearest example of that. I mean, AWS is obviously like something of an outlier, but it's obviously incredibly valuable now, but even the decision-making that they made in the business relative to someone like eBay greatly informed where they ended up but tell you what by the way real quick ebay is making some interesting moves behind the like, oh yeah under the hood yeah yeah but pin that and let's go back but anyway so i you know that comment is it gets to this it's we we live in a world of you know i'm going to sit down and build a five-year model and i'm going to get a rough idea of what the value you know even if you do at a very you know back of the envelope kind of level you're sitting down there and looking at numbers and then you add in a comment like that. And there's a certain amount of like faith involved with being that type of investor, which again, I think it's justified based on some very notable examples of when it works. And I think you only get to that position where you're willing to have 
that level of faith in certain companies or certain management teams where you've been studying them for long periods of time or been invested with them in a meaningful way for long periods of time. And it's just, I think it's one of the beneficial parts of being a more concentrated long-term investor that you can't really pick up if you're more of a scatter shot and I'm going to be in a couple things here and there for relatively short periods of time. It, it, for me, it's just harder to see how you get there. I just think the way he worded it just so perfectly nails kind of what Charlie Munger, exactly what he's saying when he says, I don't defend. I mean, that's what he means by it. That's why he's willing to do it with something like a Costco because he appreciates how these guys can just find ways to continue adding values to customers. And it eventually flows through to the results of the business in a way that's just simply, I mean, go back and read what Nick sleep wrote in 2005 or 2004 about Costco. Yeah. His estimate of what it was actually worth if I remember correctly, was probably significantly understated relative to what actually happened. And there's obviously some hindsight bias there, but you know, he, he was clearly grasping something about this business and the management team that was differentiated from what you would broadly call retail. Yeah. So it's just, I think it's, that's a fascinating part of the game. That is again, not something that you can really put into a model or an evaluation in a way, but it clearly can work, and it's. It, I just find it fascinating. Well, this is. Uh, I think. I think about you know stocks as like beachfront real estate sometimes, right? And like at the end of the day, you know, I grew up in South Florida, right? If you told me, I mean, maybe not when I was a kid, but if you told me now, I could buy a house in Delray Beach on the water, would I want that? It's not going to be a value investment, quote unquote. Do I think in the next 20 years that house is going to appreciate but for a hurricane, right? So, like, I guess I have to say, okay, well, how much can I afford to lose on this bet without, like, meaningfully changing my life? But if the facts remain as they are today, am I going to lose wealth or gain wealth owning that particular piece of property? I would rather own the beachfront real estate in Delray, than some slum at a uh, 12 cap that should trade at a 10 cap. I don't care about that thing, right? Like, like the, the cheap slum is fungible. There will always be another. That one property is scarce. Now, is there a distinction between cash flowing assets and non-cash flowing assets? Probably yes. However, let's go to media, okay? Does Netflix deserve to trade at a massive premium to the rest of media? My argument would be yes, because I think that there is one actual asset, maybe two, that has a clear path to the future with pricing power that you know no one else can replicate. And, you know, I'm sure Netflix shorts will laugh at what I'm saying, but I I think that onus is kind of on them to disprove the thesis uh my personal opinion is if you're buying some of these levered legacy companies that are trying to make a pivot and your rationale is this is cheap i think that is a way to get absolutely fucked like i don't think that's a great way to invest if you see some pathway to pivot and you think cash flows will be the same or higher in the future, fine. But if the argument is it's cheap relative to Netflix and where and Disney and where they should trade, like I almost think if you're doing a comp set, you need to remove Netflix and Disney from your comp set, and then you got the rest of the stuff, and then you better hope that the rest of the stuff doesn't fade as you are waiting for your re-rate. Yeah, yeah another way is to— Is that rambly? No, no, I don't, no, I don't think it is. I think another way to say it is, or as I think about it, you know, I think a very sensible, sensible approach that Bill Nygren's talked about is this idea of they model things out seven years and in year seven, everything. Yeah. I I got to ask him about this. I don't understand why he puts everything in a market multiple. Well, I think they do it because they are effectively saying that you can't see out in the future beyond that point. And I I think what you're effectively saying about, the beachfront real estate, or I'd say certain businesses and certain management teams is that it's patently absurd based on the work you've done and the things that you've seen to say that after seven years, it's going to be, you're making some comment about 
the duration of the asset or obviously, you know, growth, value creation, whatever, some combination of all those things where you say, even if I can't obviously make, you know, very specific comments about what this looks like 10, 20 years down the road, there's something here that leads me to believe that I need to have a certain amount of hope (laughs) that's essentially built into this. And you can completely reject that and sell Microsoft in 2016 at, you know, 20 or 25 times earnings, as I'm sure, you know, many traditional value investors did. And even myself, I, I trimmed that points in that time period. When? Like 2015, 2016. Okay. I, I think around that period is when it really, it really started taking off in a way that, and my dates may be a little bit off, but as I remember it, to 2011, 12, 13 period when the value investors were really interested in Microsoft, and again, myself compl- included, it was three, four years later where they were like, okay, this is, this is kind of worked in the definition of a, you know, value investment. Hmm. And now the PE has gone from 10 to 20 or 25. Yeah, yeah. And now's the time to get off the boat. And I think part of the lesson I've learned in hindsight is. Yeah, damn, that was right before it really ramped. There's some reason to think that that was probably the exact wrong time to sell. It may have actually been a time, time to, to buy. Add. Yeah, no doubt. And what were. In retrospect, easy to say, but. Yes, that is definitely true. But if you look at what was actually going on during that time period, I mean, the most notable one is they set the commercial cloud goals yep. for 2018 that they would get to, I think it was 20 billion by that point, And they ended up hitting it, you know, pretty well ahead of that time frame. And I think, again, like you look at something like management, I think you had enough information at that time to start to really understand that the changes underway were not just small positive for the business, not something that deserved for it to trade at three turns of a premium to the S&P 500 or something. It was putting the company in a position to be significantly better than where it had been. And you can look even today, like look at the thing Ben Thompson wrote about, which I would think we'd both agree is a pretty good analyst in terms of thinking about technology companies and where they're going over time. Like what he wrote about Microsoft is a good encapsulation of kind of how the business is positioned today. And again, just to think that you would sell something like that. And I used to think this way. And again, I acted on it in a small way, but just selling something because, okay, well, you know, now the PE's at X number. I think that approach clearly has downsides. Again, there's certainly some cap in terms of how you think about these things, but cutting off right tails, you you said one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is, you know, Value. Yes, please heap praise on me. Do you even remember the quote? I know. Yeah, I know. I said value investors look at the left tail of outcomes. And growth investors think about the right tail. There you go. Uh, and I think that's moderately correct. I think in order to be a good value investor, you've got to look up in order to really understand the full distribution of outcomes. And um, I think too many people that are attracted to the value camp only look down. And I don't think they allow themselves to look up. And and I think that that really truncates the potential return. You know, I was on the Chat Money Pod and I said, think about someone who's paying the Roku tax. If you're a VOD service, you're competing with Netflix. Let's say you have the same, you know, you have the same budget, you have the same number of subs, you have the same ARP, who's everything. I have a billion dollars to work with, let's say. And you're paying them a tax. Let's assume all your customers are through them. You're paying the tax and you have 850 to work with. Like I'm in a very significantly advantageous position relative to you in terms of operating my business in terms of how much content I can put on there in terms of how much I can pay for the content, et cetera. You're are you talking about the channel right now. Yeah. I'm talking about some, some player on there who's actually paying the tax versus yeah. a Netflix who is not paying the tax at all. Yeah. Some of these things will just naturally drive consolidate. I mean, Netflix can I, dude, there's no fucking way that Paramount and Comcast continue this strategy. I'm sorry, there's not. Like, maybe for one or two years. That this stuff can be cute to play with, and you can hope that you have some outcome at the end of the rainbow. But there, it's not there. They're spending real money. And, yeah. you know, I think part of the question is, especially but, in this regulatory environment, like, how does how does that get Well, dude, and I was resolved? talking to Francisco. If you're Comcast, I get it if you're Paramount, right? You got no choice. But if you're Comcast, at what point does Peacock, like, why are you spending the money on Peacock? You should be spending the money on driving fiber deep into your broadband business. Like, it is a misallocation of capital. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I peacock don't. is the tree that fell in the woods that no one heard. <laughs> like it's it's fine to think that it can turn into something, but it can't. Yeah, I don't think it's going to turn into anything. I mean, I think the the eventual strategy here, they do, they either need to get bigger or they need to sell. And I've been saying some version of that for a long time now, and I think that's still pretty evident today. And again, you're seeing pay TV numbers that are, you know, we saw Verizon today. It's not a big MVPD, but, you know, their subs are down 9% year over year. Most of the traditional MVPDs are seeing significant pressure on their business. And some of that's being offset by VMVPDs, but, you know, most of those are month-long agreements. So someone can stick around for a couple months during football season yeah. and, and then cut it off. And if you're a media company, you're not going to get paid. So we've said this a million times to each other, but the price of the traditional bundle continues to go up. The value offered continues to go down, especially for younger audiences and especially for entertainment programming. And that, that has completely dried up and you know, what good content is left is being pushed to each of these companies streaming Except services. Except for the MTV challenge. Yes, I know that you love that show. That still on the bundle. Is that on I Paramount Plus? It. You might be able to watch it without ads. I don't, no, <laughs> I don't think I can. I think I get uh, like the MTV challenge all-stars on Paramount Plus, which sounds, I would I would watch. That sounds good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty <laughs> pathetic, but I would watch all of it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it'll all shake out. It's going to be interesting to watch, man. But I, I do think the natural progression of this probably leads to paramount licensing content and or selling but the problem with them selling is one you got to get shari to want to and two you got like the there's a lot of bundle assets in there yeah so you almost have to do asset sales yeah i do think a lot of their a lot of their franchises are are very good and especially to netflix like those are real churn produce like reducers yeah, I mean, I, mean, I know I, I homer out on the challenge, but the challenge is dope. Like, yeah, they could you, do something with that. Yeah, I, I, Francisco and I were talking about this today. I, I think there is, to your point, I don't, I don't think they want to sell for one. I, you know, if we're talking about someone like Netflix, I don't. I think they've been pretty clear that they have no interest in buying the linear channels. Basically, yeah, they don't want it. So CBS, in theory, could you know, just continue. They, they could basically operate the Fox strategy with a licensing agreement across all of their, con- I mean, obviously after current agreements run out, they could run. But how do they compete with Disney when they have to go out and renew the NFL down the road? Like what's your terminal value on that asset? I think it's very difficult because Disney is going to play both sides of this, both sides of this in a way that in my opinion, nobody else really can or at least has shown no ability to so far and it's again it's still very very early in terms of uh engagement on you know a lot of these over the top offerings and you can i think you can honestly make the point that the people who have their back against the wall or someone like amazon who just purely has solely you know an ott strategy they may find the path forward in sports quicker than disney given the fact that disney has a little bit more of a balanced strategy I think that could potentially happen, but we'll see. And Paramount's a good example. They have been a little bit more aggressive in terms of their NFL content being on Paramount Plus, and Disney has been with NFL content being on ESPN in some ways. So I don't know. It would be interesting to see. I think Paramount, I think they could do something like the Fox strategy and then license all the content. And you and you, you could do it like a Hulu sort of way of, or kind of like how HBO does now with, you know, House of the Dragon and things. You just drop the show on Netflix or wherever you're licensing it to at the same time that it's on, you know, whenever, the yeah. ch- whenever the challenge is airing on TV, it can just drop there at the same time or the day after. So I, I think they could find a path forward there that may be, I'm just becoming a little bit more negative, generally speaking, on these big companies being able to get M&A done. I mean, not even just in tech. I think generally speaking, it's very difficult. Yeah. And that's a tough spot to be in, especially in an industry where you need consolidation. Yeah. <laughs> House of the Dragon's really good. I don't know, man. Warner Brothers Discovery is going to be really interesting. I mean, I've said it to you a thousand times. Uh, Netflix has what Zaslov said he wanted. But now that Zaslov <laughs> has sports, he, you know, wants what he has. But I think that's a function of having the cards he has and not. Or, like, look, one of, one of two things is true. Either he believed what he was saying in the past or he believes what he's saying now. Yeah. 
Either way, I think they're motivated statements. Like, I, I'm certain one of those things is true. Yeah. I'm just not certain which motivated statement is closer to reality. Yeah. I mean, zooming out just to investing generally, it is funny how, you know, they're just the two most notable examples. I've had plenty, KHC, plenty of others, but it's funny how ATUS and WBD were very similar in terms of the thesis never changed as the stock price went from a high number to a significantly lower number. Charter may be similar, man. Be careful what you're saying. It very well could be. It very well could be. I think there's a lot of reasons why it's very different, but it could be. But, you know, that's the tough things with these names. And I don't, I'm not even sure the lesson is that, especially if you're going to operate from the perspective of being a business owner, that you can necessarily avoid them. I think the bigger lesson is, and again, something you and I talk about a ton, is position sizing and thinking about how you react when something like that goes lower and lower and lower. And you really have to ask yourself, is this business actually getting better is there, are there cracks here? There might be a real problem. I mean, in the case of Altis, there was a real problem. Yeah. <laughs> it turned out in the case of Warner brothers, there very may well be a real problem. Again, going back to sports rights, like they so far have no strategy for, for taking what they have on linear and putting it on a direct to consumer offering. And that is not the easiest thing to do without branding, without a lot of technology spend, et cetera, et cetera. So if the bundle is getting to a place, I mean, even someone like Bob Iger now, he was the former CEO of Disney. He's saying this is heading to a precipice and it's going to fall off. Well, it can't like, not. It's not all Reed Hastings and people who are going to, you know, TTD, people who are going to benefit from the CTV explosion. It's people who are legacy media people. By so, the way, if you're still with us and you're not a media person, TTD is the trade desk and CTV is uh, connected TV. What does trade desk do, by the way? Would you like to answer that for us? Because I'm not sure I can answer. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I can answer either. I just know it's uh, everything on the internet, not named Google and Facebook. Um, that sounds and, like a lot. Yeah, it does sound like a lot. I, Dude, I need to read their investor day. I don't know. I've always kicked myself. The Adam Robinson quote, things that make no sense and things that are blatantly obvious. I've been kicking myself lately because I wasn't interested. I I have such an aversion to Elon Musk's personality that I haven't been interested in Tesla, the company. And uh, I opened up the financials and I was like, man, this is fucking crazy. Now, a lot of people are going to say it's a fraud. Fine. Like all y'all can debate all that. All I'm saying is, what that guy has created is pretty incredible, right? I yeah. I hope we can all kind of like baseline agree on that. The stock, I have no interest in owning. People can debate it all they want. And one of the other things that I think has been blatantly obvious is how often the trade desk comes up in conversations. And I still don't have like a really good view of what they do outside of that one podcast that came out in like 2019 and I should have just listened to it and bought the trade desk. It would have been like by far my best performer, but um, I don't know. Yeah. I like John Hampton's take on Elon. He said, I'm going to paraphrase it badly, but he said something like, you know, on one hand you have a fraudster and a scumbag. On the other hand, you have somebody who sent a rocket into space and was able to make it come back and like land on a platform. Yeah. (laughs) So you have an interesting mix of person in there. Yeah. Maybe not someone to bet against. (laughs) And, and maybe or at least not, not so, much. Yeah, and maybe not someone to bet on, right? Like it, it's it's okay to not have money involved and also make observations of a situation. Yeah. I did not appreciate how I think he treated Twitter during this process. I also have never done a $44 billion deal. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what it's like to feel like I overpaid by $20 billion and to do whatever I have to do to get out of it, right? So uh-huh. I don't know. He's an odd cat, man. But I do know that that I think EVs are going to continue to take share, and I do think this Inflation Reduction Act is a big deal. I don't know how to play it yet, but, you know, we'll see. Hopefully, uh, if I can find one idea, I think Munger says that's all you need. He may not say that, but I'm going to say he said that. <laughs> how do you think about with something like that, how would you think about, you know, getting up to speed? Obviously, it could take some time. It's a relatively new I think area. It's take years. It could take years. 
you know, I, I, as I said to you today, I think it's it's kind of interesting to look at at railroads and Berkshire's activity there in hindsight, where you know the the real the real OR uh, operating ratio improvements started in call it the 2004 timeframe, and Buffett had some bets in place for sure before the BNSF deal, but he really didn't take that really big step for it, it took five years basically. And obviously, some of it was just seeing that it was real and that it was, you know, as, as has been proven in hindsight, very sustainable and incredible. I mean, these businesses have gone from 10% EBIT margins to 40% EBIT margins. Like, it's been a massive change in terms of the industry economics. But it's it's just funny to think that, you know, again, he had a lot of patience. He has he has an interesting combination that I you don't see very often in terms of, both patience, but also the willingness to bet really big. And again, another, and as I mentioned before, Ocri is another firm that strikes me that operates in that same manner where, you know, what are, as Chris said on your pod, you know, like Visa and MasterCard, basically the same bet. In yeah. Their mind. I mean, how, yeah. the position size is it's like 20% of their fund. I mean, it's, it's a big bet when you think about it as a single, single thing. And same with uh, AMT and the other entity that's a similar. I mean, they, they place big bets and they're things that they're going to own for very long periods of time. And it's just so uncommon. They're like you don't, I don't see many other people operating in that way. And yet you look at, you know, the track records that people like them have put up and it, it's eye opening and you would think more people would copy it. Yeah. Well, I, uh, <laughs> but I re- it's also very hard to do. <laughs> I recently put on the Twitter machine, uh, I th- I think it's Eric Mand- Mandelblatt. Uh, I apologize if that's wrong, but the guy from Saraban that invests like the best podcast that he did. I think that can be a really interesting thing to revisit right now. Um, look, I I think I'm sixty percent uh, confident that NAFTA is going to have a pretty good run here. I uh, don't know what the stocks are going to do. I have no idea what that means for each region. I think that it's reasonably probable that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was actually a pretty well-crafted trade bill at the end of the day. And I think it's reasonably probable that it's going to bring CapEx and jobs here. And I think, especially if you believe we're going to some stagflationary environment, it would be really dumb to not try to study who are the companies that are getting the subsidies and who are the tangential beneficiaries. But I have no idea uh, how to play that yet. I just, I guess uh, what I've realized is I don't need to have that answer now. What I need to do is to put, yeah, well, some of the subsidies don't come out till 2024. And uh, what we're recording on, what is it? What did we say? October 21st. So I mm-hmm. think the market probably looks out to like October 25th <laughs> of 2022. So uh, I, th- I think I probably have some time. And, um, you know, we'll see. I don't know. I do have some listener questions, though, for you. Oh, boy. Yeah, man. I, I sent out a, first of all, the man, Viggy. He wants. He says, "Curious for uh, Alex's take on all the recent drama at Ally." Uh, that's a very good question. I'm still working on. That's the, how Viggy does. Yeah, he's, he's a very well, smart guy. Viggy is a very smart guy. I'm still working through the most recent quarter. You know, it's funny. It, as I spend more time in this game, I came from the perspective early on that short-term market moves are completely irrelevant, and you just live in your own bubble and think about things in that way. And, you know, Ally is a good example of how at times a stock can move in very significant ways and it's smart people seeing things that are coming around the corner. <laughs> and yeah. I think, I think that's happened here and maybe some of the things that have, have played out particularly in terms of, you know, rates on the short end have maybe should have been uh, perceivable even at a high level before we got here. Um, you know, with the specifics of, what, of what's happened lately, the CFO resigning or getting fired, whatever, you know, however you want to label it day before the earnings call is obviously a terrible development. Last thing you want to see the day before an earnings call. Um, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm still working through some of my thoughts and working through some of you know, the things I'm going to share with subscribers. It's for me, there's a certain test that companies need 
to pass and, and companies, I should say management teams more directly that, you know, how you think about communicating with shareholders is a very important relationship. And I, I think, you know, Charlie and Warren say it in kind of the way of if we were sitting on the other side of the table, we'd give you all the information that we think you should have if, if we were in your seat. And in this case, there was an 8K, which is obviously required by law, and no press release, which maybe isn't the biggest thing in the world, but for me, it's a relatively important thing. I want to hear what happened, and I want to hear why it happened. And you could say the conference calls the next day, but I think they should have addressed it more directly at the outset. So is that a deal breaker? I don't think it necessarily is, but I would want and you know more directly expect the company to do better on something like that going forward. And if, if it were to happen again, it probably would be a deal breaker for me just in terms of how I think about the people that I want to partner with and the companies I want to invest behind for the long term, because there's other options to look at, you know, in terms of the underlying results, I, we've obviously gone through a crazy environment in terms of used car pricing and that is concerning and, but it's also very obvious. <laughs> and in terms of their credit underwriting, they should be thinking about that. And, you know, as I, as I wrote in the deep dive on Ally, you, you have some historical reference in terms of financial crisis for how this asset class performed. And I think how it performed and how I would expect it to perform in a very difficult environment going forward, you know, it's, it's kind of logical given the nature of what the asset is, given the duration of the loan, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, I, I think it's an asset class that I like, but they're also you know, moving into to other types of lending, which may be a smart thing to do, but will certainly come with a learning curve. And some of the stuff that they're doing is unsecured consumer lending and things like, like it's different. And it could certainly have a very significant cost as part of that learning. So I think there's puts and takes as always. I less often go back to this idea of like, well, it's cheap. Like I'm just going to stick with it because it's cheap. Um, it's It's very much a trying to constantly update business outlook five years out, quality of management team, et cetera. So I, I still need to f- kind of get my head straight in terms of where that's at. But this past week was very, certainly not what you wanted to see. And again, less so in terms of the business results, more so in terms of how some of this stuff was communicated. It, it, it left a sour taste in my mouth for sure. Interesting. Sometimes I don't know how much communication matters. And sometimes I think it's like a ton, you know, like one of the things that I think Buffett has done the best is be a communicator, right? Like he's created this aura of truth around him and I believe it's well-deserved, but I also believe it's well-crafted. Like he is too smart not to understand how he approaches communications. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. That, that was a bizarre series of events. I, I didn't understand how you would pre-announce the CFO leaving. You do kind of think people that don't understand communications maybe don't understand other things that are not so small, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think in this specific case, you know, based on what was said on the conference call, my read on it is the CFO had sites at a more meaningful role, potentially at the company, which, you know, obviously would probably mean the CEO spot. CEO probably has no intention of leaving. I guess things can get personal and can get muddy from there. Where it would get to the point where it's announced effective immediately the day before the call. Yeah, it's odd. Suggests that it got really muddy and that's certainly not good. And, you know, it's, I'll, the company's also the more nefarious thing is she's got some like there's some reserves that sure I disagree on right sure sure could be that as well and again the company's you know now looking ahead at a 12 to 18 month period that is certainly not going to be i mean 18 months ago was as rosy as it can be but yeah. <laughs> it's certainly not going to be you know anywhere close to that and it may be even below kind of what baseline expectations would be for this business so it's going to be a tough period i certainly will be looking to do more digging on this and trying to get a better sense for what actually happened to the extent that's possible. But it's, it's painting my views on this business in a big way, which doesn't feel good when, you know, obviously I don't typically disclose on podcasts when I've done things, but I added a little bit more recently and, you know, it presents a tough decision. You, especially when you, 
you know, and you can talk about this as well as someone who's public, when you are telling people what you're doing and you're trying to be very logical and sensible about it, and again, also trying to be very long-term, feels very weird to turn around and say potentially the right decision here to sell is to sell. But this is one of the things that I like the most <laughs> about Ackman's uh, Netflix decision. Yeah. And I don't think it's that easy to disclose a position that publicly and then flip. And people can say he flipped too quick and people can take shots at him. I'm going to argue a lot of those shots are jealousy. Sorry if you hear this and you're <laughs> mad because I triggered something in you. But I do think that the way he flipped on that, uh, it's tough, man. Yeah. Well, and to the point you made at the time he did it, and the fact that the stock now is higher than when he sold is is potentially irrelevant for the reason you made, which is he may have just looked at the opportunity set and found something he liked better. And that's what he said. Yeah. And, you know, again, I, I, I think some of this is just simply a choice of what kind of investor you want to be and what kind of constraints can be used, I think, in a helpful way in terms of what situations you'll ever get involved in. And maybe there's very rare instances where you break that. If it's like a naked wine situation where something happened that seems pretty big when it did happen or something like what's going on with Ally. And, you know, maybe you say one out of a hundred times I'll potentially, you know, have to break these rules for a very specific reason. But I also think there's a lot of value in having these constraints in terms of what it actually gets you into in the first place. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, we're going to ask you one more from the listener question, and then you and I are going to hang out because uh, I've enjoyed this very much, but I'm ready to just hang. Uh, how does Alex determine when to invest in or sell a position? Well, invest in, that can be pretty simple in terms of, as I, I think I said to Francisco recently, like I've been doing this for over a decade now. There's like 20 businesses that I really feel I have my arms around. <laughs> <laughs> so the hardest part is literally just getting to the point where I feel I am in a position where I really want to place the bet. And again, for people who don't, I've read my work. I, I, I have a rule for myself, which I'm, I don't make any positions, a minimum position size of 5%. So I, I want to make a real bet. I force myself to make a real bet. And again, my intention is to be partner with these people for five to 10 years. So it's, you know, a fairly high bar. So yeah, I have to be able to get my arms around the business, around the industry, have, you know, kind of clear line of sight to where it's going to be over five to 10 years. Hopefully earnings power has gone up very significantly over that period. So that's kind of a starting point And you know, that can take a while. Um, it's not as, at least not yet, not as long as Buffett with his 50 years of IBM <laughs> annual reports yeah. before he invested. Um, but there's certainly companies that companies I've been following for years that have just been, you know, on the sidelines through that whole period. And, Again, I think there's a ton of value. Nike's a good example now, which I don't own. They're going through inventory issues in North America. And I, I watched this exact same thing happen in 2016. They went through this exact same thing. And, you know, it gave me some insight into how this works and how the market will react to it and how sell side will be forced to, you know, think about hmm. these things in a certain way because of the incentives of their job and what short-term price movements mean for, how they talk about these this things. This is even odder speaking. though, because uh, a lot of people are dealing with inventory issues. Yes, that is very true. But anyway, so I think there, you know, there's there's value that comes from you know that that time from following a company and management team closely. So once I can eventually get my arms around something, you know, in terms of valuation, I do generally build models, you know, depending on the industry to the extent that it's feasible. But it isn't the driving factor in my decision making by any stretch. I mean, obviously it is in, a, in like a range, but I'm much more concerned on the people I'm betting behind and the businesses I'm betting behind. And I do think about more now than I used to, you know, you and I have said to each other, you know, a year isn't that long in terms of like an Excel spreadsheet, but living through a year Dude, is actually a long period brutal. of time. So I, I do try to think about, you know, is this business actually performing well? Is the trajectory looking good? before I, you know, either buy an initial position or start adding to it. So on the buy side, you know, it's, it's just really understanding the business and understanding the management team on selling, you know, I lean, I lean more towards the OC review of is the business broken is, is there been some transformative M and a that is really going to take their eye off the ball. It's those type of things. Like I keep valuation in focus and I, you know, I think about it, but it's not the driving factor. 
you know, and again, I think personal circumstances do have an impact on how I approach this. And going back to the Buffett Coke example, we talked before, I'm still fairly young and I'm going to be a net saver, you know, hopefully for at least another 20 years. So I have a little bit of flexibility in terms of needing to sell things to have the capital Hmm. versus just having incremental savings over time that again, can kind of of naturally take the position size down as he did with Coke without ever selling a share position size went from, I think it might've peaked just, just South of 40% of the book. And as of the most recent annual report, it was like 7% Mm -hmm. of the equity book. So, you know, there's some ability to do that. That's smart. So yeah, that's I mean that's how I generally think about it. It's it's just business if if there's cracks or major changes in the story. Yeah. All right. Well, cool, man. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming up to my hometown. I've had a great day with you. Uh, Sorry, I kicked your ass in tennis. I didn't mean to. It's okay. You got two <laughs> forehands, man. I can't fuck with that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I hope you all enjoyed the episode. Alex, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll uh, talk soon. All right. See you. I'm